So this week we've got Tony Doyle with us from Seagull Aerial Survey and Photography Limited. Thanks for joining us today, Tony. Uh, so again, we'll uh, be moving away from our normal weekly structure uh, and uh, have an informal chat with Tony about his business, the drones that he uses, and uh, I guess how he sort of got to where he is today, really. So uh, yeah, like I mentioned before, Tony, thanks for uh, coming along. How are you doing today? I'm good, thanks. Yes, yes, looking forward to it. Great, lovely. Uh, we've also got Adam with us as well. So uh, Adam, do you want to say a quick uh, hello as well? Yes, hi all. It's a lovely day here today. So we're looking forward to uh, sweating away for the next half an hour. <laughs> That's it, yeah. Hopefully it won't get uh, too warm in uh, in the different studios that we're using at the moment anyway. But uh, yeah, so what we'll do is basically uh, just make a start really. So we've got a few bullet points listed down here to uh, talk to Tony about. And uh, like we mentioned previously, uh, previously, it's just basically just an informal talk and uh, basically sort of an overview of uh, kind of what Tony's been doing really. So um, I guess um, we'll, we'll start uh, from the beginning, Tony, I suppose, really. So uh, how did you kind of get into uh, the industry that you're sort of currently working in? And uh, yeah, how, how did it all come about, I suppose, really? Well, for me, it was, uh, <clears throat> I suppose it was a natural evolution. I've, um, I've worked for, in the roofing industry for over 30 years. Um, mm -hmm. I've been working for roofing contractors, uh, roofing manufacturers, not on the tools I hasten to have, never, uh, <laughs> never really get my hands dirty, but uh, on the uh, roof inspection, surveying side, estimating, contract management, that kind of thing. Uh -huh. um, for manufacturers, I was doing specification sales, so trying to persuade architects and surveyors to use the manufacturer's products. Yeah. So <laughs> I've been doing that for a long time. Um, but I got to an age really where I'd got a bit fed up climbing up and down ladders and scrambling around on old roofs and um, I'd sort of seen what was happening with drones and how they were starting to be used in the roofing industry mm. um, and I got interested so I bought myself a drone, uh, did some practice, signed up for the training course with uh, UAV Hope or Aerial yeah. Motion Pictures as That's it was right. at yeah. the time, When, when was that now? What, what, when was that? It was a few years ago now, wasn't it? It, I'm was, to think. Uh, it was late in 2018. Oh, really? Oh, right. So it was so, that, that long ago. <laughs> yeah, just over two and a half years, probably, you know, yeah, coming okay. up to three years. Yeah, brilliant. That's um, right. yeah. But I, yeah, I bought the drone around about this time three years ago and then started practicing. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I've had an eye that one day I'd move into the drone thing fully mm. and then really the best thing that could ever happen happened to me um, and I got made redundant. <laughs> so it's a case then of either sink or swim isn't it and yes. rather than go looking for another job I thought right so I'll put myself into the, the drone thing properly uh, mm. and set myself up um, to do roofing works generally um, using the drone and the rest as they say is history. I see. Brilliant. So you sort of had all the knowledge, I suppose, from your previous employment. Uh, and you obviously um, had an idea that I'm sure, like uh, when we were talking to Stacey in a previous episode, that drones could probably make your life a lot easier and probably the work you were doing uh, would be much quicker and potentially much safer as well with the aircraft too. Were they the sort of the big benefits, I suppose? They, they were, they were, yes. And I mean, this is going back three or four years now. And um drones were beginning to be used then but mm. not really as prevalent as they are now mm. uh, but you know i knew a number of contractors who bought their own small drones for example um, and okay. i'd seen that there was um, surveying companies starting to do it so yeah I, I could see that they were going to be part of the roofing industry in the future uh, and they solved a number of problems and yeah it was natural for me to do that because that was my background so yeah. Yeah. See. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's good. Yeah. Adam, anything to sort of add to this uh, subject before we sort of carry on? Or yeah, just interested to uh, what was your uh, what was the first drone that you uh, you started to use? Oh yeah. <laughs> well, the first one I bought was a a, a second hand unique Typhoon H. Uh, uh, yeah, that's right. Which I uh, practiced with um, on a nearby beach by n near where I live, <laughs> um, and just got familiar with it and. Well, it's a great drone. I still use it now. It's an obsolete machine now. They don't make it anymore. It's been succeeded by uh, uh, another model, but I still mm. use it. It's it's still my fallback drone. And, um, yeah. well, you never forget your first love, do you? So <laughs> <laughs> it was my first one, and I've stuck with the unique uh, yeah. since. I, I, awesome. I just like it. Yeah, I see. So what have you got now kind of uh, in the hangar, so to speak? What are, well, uh, what are your models? I think having got into the 
or decided I was getting into the roofing industry and I was going to do roof inspections with drones and I thought I was going to do lots of promotional video and photography mm. um, and very quickly realised that you could do an awful lot more with drones than just take pictures um, okay. and I could see that possibly mapping, surveying, maybe modelling was something to look at for the future. Um, so I bought myself uh, another unique, uh, again, second-hand, um, a Typhoon, uh, the H520, which is uh, okay. a bit bigger than the H, um, mm. but it's programmed for surveying and mapping. Oh, okay. And uh, I bought that off a guy who um, had gone to work for a police force as a drone pilot, so he was selling <laughs> off all his own kit. Ah, I see. And uh, that, that was... Two years ago I bought that now and that really is still my workhorse, so I still use it mainly. Um, okay. I've got three cameras that go on it. <clears throat> one of them is, uh, is a particularly good camera, it's, it's, uh, it's got the one inch Hasselblad sensor, gives ah, great okay. photographs mm. and, um, and, and I do like that one. So it's, it's the main thing that I use. Yeah. Um, I've also, like a lot of people, recently bought uh, the DJI Mini 2. Um, oh, yeah. Because that <laughs> can solve, <laughs> yeah, that can solve a number of issues, which we might yeah. get into a bit later on. But yes, uh, that's a yes. useful little tool as well. I um, see. Oh, brilliant! So you've got um, a couple of aircraft that can sort of cater for quite a few different bits and pieces, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I try to use horses for courses, really, and use the right tool for the right job. Mm. Um, yeah. But I do like the um, the camera on the H520. Uh, I think it, it goes gives particularly good pictures and generally default to that one whenever I can. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice actually to uh, to kind of hear somebody using a different drone that's not just uh, DJI. Mm. Um, <laughs> I think Unique are quite overlooked generally. They just, um, everyone's always DJI, DJI. But it's great that actually, you know, there's someone touting and shouting about a different manufacturer and a different aircraft. Yeah, well, I've, I've never really used the DJI ones other than the Mini. I've seen them. Uh, mm. I've seen Inspires in action and uh, and the Mavics, um, so I can't really make a direct comparison. But all I can say is that the the uniques for me do the job well, and uh, I like the results that they provide. And the mapping function on the H five twenty is is very simple to use. I use the Unique's own um, data mapping uh, uh, okay. f- software, and it's uh, it's it, it's dead straightforward. So mm. um, I, you know, I, I like them and got no reason to change at the moment no no you know the system and that's the worst thing you can do i think after knowing the system is then moving to a different one because it's quite confusing then it's thinking right how do i start this one and how do i stop this one because they can be quite different actually and quite varied so yeah to be honest <laughs> i found that with the mini a little bit lately yeah, I've been using yeah. that and i wasn't used to the dji geofencing and the uh, locking and unlocking yes. uh, and <laughs> that is something new to me and it's that's that's another mm. little learning curve i've had to climb up yeah uh, so when it works the, it's it's great but sometimes it it can be a bit quirky. Yeah. Well, the uniques don't have the, the, the geofencing, or, or at least not to that level anyway. No. Uh, so I've never really had a problem with the uniques and geofencing. Mm. You can pretty much fly them anywhere. Um, yeah. Obviously, I don't, not without the right permissions, but... Yeah, um, of course. Yeah, yeah the, the DJI locking and unlocking was a bit of a, um, <laughs> a learning curve for me. Yeah, I see. Brilliant. Yeah, so going back to kind of, um, obviously... Uh, the, the sort of the day job I suppose really what are what are your sort of client base at the moment then what what are your kind of typical clients and uh, type of type of jobs and work that you do with these aircraft right well all my client base are, are business customers so people mm. like building surveying companies roofing contractors property developers uh, school and college estates um, okay. I do very little private residential type work mm. um, and the type of properties that you know they're looking after, mm. it's large warehouses, industrial units, factory premises, oh, okay. uh, commercial blocks, um, school estates, university estates, that kind oh. of thing. So large areas then, really, I guess. Ten, tends to be larger jobs, yes. Mm. Yeah, I mean, oh, I every now and again they'll throw a little one in, but um, yeah, it's the sort of stuff that the, the, the larger companies would would be dealing with they'd be the consultants or the agents for and and they um they'll pass the jobs on to me fantastic so how do you um how, without giving you know the trade secrets away for yourself <laughs> um how do you generally you know sort of get your work you know if if you know, say someone was sorting out most people kind of say oh well, i'll set up a website how do you how do you generally find you get most of your business in <clears throat> um 
Well, that's, it's an interesting one. That I started off, um, obviously, with connections in the building surveying industry with, amongst roofing contractors, um, some estates managers of universities and colleges. And I thought, oh, well, I'll just go and tell all them what I can do and um, I will be away. And, and it didn't quite work like that. Cause, <laughs> <laughs> well, what you find is they don't quite share your enthusiasm for the aerial photography that you think is wonderful and fantastic and everyone's going to want it. And in practice, you know, these guys have been getting along very nicely for, you know, for years and, and you're bringing them something new and different. Mm. So, you know, really it was a little bit of a step back. So I ended up, so you, you not ended up, but in order to generate your business initially, you, there's, you, you've got to be doing some freebies and, you know, try and, get in with people that way but gradually they you know you get an order here and an order there and it, it does it does grow mm. um, and I, once you've got um, a client base of a, a number of companies who keep coming back as I have then yeah you don't need too many if they keep coming back with repeat mm. business you don't need too many to keep yourself busy yeah, and, uh, I suppose especially as you as a are you do you just work alone are you sort of a, a one-man band as it were or do you have other people that work for you I am a one-man band, but I have uh, used other drone pilots occasionally to yeah. to assist. So, yeah. I mean, even for example, this morning I was out on a large school estate, which has taken me two days to to do all the roof inspections of. But oh, right. in, in order to share the load, I uh, invited another pilot who I I know, and he came along and he did some of the uh, photography for me. So, um, and. Yeah, so, yeah, one-man band, but I'm not averse to calling in for some help when I need it. <laughs> yeah. But in, in terms of new business, though, I mean, obviously, a repeat business is the, the best kind of business. It's, it's the, the it's, it's the most economical type of new business, you know, because it yeah. doesn't really cost you anything. But um, uh, I suppose the cost of acquisition is negligible then because you've already got the customer there. You've already spent the money getting them originally, and now, now you're just like, right, you can just mm. keep... Yeah, they just keep going back for and paying you to use your services, which is great. Yeah, and that's true. And um, and the other good thing, the the thing that I've found works well, um, is LinkedIn. And um, okay. I've found that I, I'm quite surprised at how good that is. Really, I get a fair amount of new business out of LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, and it was something I've, I've went to a, a few seminars that Matt Williams. Um, <laughs> obviously, we we all know Matt. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> And he'd done a few seminars, and one of the things he said was, you must be on LinkedIn and you must use it. And I thought, well, that's a bit of a surprise. I wasn't sure about that, but I did it. And um, I found that if you just if you are active and constructive on LinkedIn, it does generate inquiries. So I would that's recommend great. We had, it. We had, a, we had a very similar kind of... Um, yeah, Stacey, who we interviewed um, on the last episode... Mm. Um, yeah, she pretty much said almost the same thing. It's just she get she gets a lot of air business now from from LinkedIn. Yeah. We need to be sponsored by them, don't we? Actually, it seems <laughs> everyone seems to talk about LinkedIn very in, uh, very highly, which is which think, is great to hear. I think it's a case of how you use it as well. I mean, if all you do is tick a like every now and again, and, and yeah, you've you got know, to be interactive on, on you, the platform. You, you've got to create dialogues with people and and put try and put constructive information there, um, and not just sort of keep badgering people say you know texting them or messaging them and saying give us a job you know i can do that for you and all that kind of thing you you've, you've got to build it slowly with a bit of dialogue and i think over time it um, it does generate work it's good so that, that's basically it uh, i have a website it's it's currently being rebuilt uh, but i've never really marketed myself through the website it's it's always been more of a a business card if you like yeah i see so all of these jobs obviously that you're doing what uh what are sort of the the main focus points then so what what are you sort of offering i suppose as a service it service if people don't know what a what a roof survey is what, what are you looking for um <clears throat> right um what i offer is roof inspections which could be just a set of photographs for the client to assess for themselves uh, but I do do condition reports as well. So if the client wants a full report on the roof, I'll do that. Uh, I do some site mapping, which quite a few clients like, uh, of the same site. So it, it's you know it's good for a school estate, for example, to do a map of the whole school grounds. You know the, the clients okay. and the schools do like that. And I do some uh, promotional 
photography or, or video filming. Um, okay. That's the lesser side of what I do. Mm. But um, I, I find a lot of contractors don't really want to pay for that. The, you know, <laughs> they, they may want it for their websites or social media, um, but it's only really the bigger companies who are prepared to pay for something a bit more a bit bespoke, you know. Yeah, um, I see. So that's what I offer in the main. It's mostly roof inspection work. Um, I think then <laughs> we have to make a distinction really between, um, but to, to clarify what is inspection work because mm. um, it's a sort of a term that covers a, a multitude of sins really. Uh, so I think we need to remember that the drone is, it's basically a flying camera. So anything that you yeah. do, um, with the drone, it's purely an external visual look at the roof. Mm. So, you know, I think we need to be just a bit realistic and a bit honest, you know, with what we offer. Um, if all the client wants is an external look at the roof, just to see the external condition, looking for things like missing slates or lead flashings that have dropped out or things like that, um, that's fine. So, you know, and and that's what I offer mainly and. Uh, mm. I would class that as maintenance inspection. Okay. So the clients know, well, okay, the, the roof's in good condition or no, we need to climb up and we need to do a few repairs. Right. Um, some clients want a bit more. If they're doing a full roof survey, um, there's a lot of roof below what you can see on the outside. Oh, there's see, there's yeah. layers <laughs> below and uh, mm. you know, you've got layers of insulation, you've got ventilation. Um, ah. A lot of roofs fail through internally through condensation on the inside um, okay. so all those sort of factors even the structure of the the, the roof you know what's holding the, the roof up mm. all those factors would go into a, a thorough roof survey um, <clears throat> and obviously the drone can only contribute so much to that it can look at the exterior but if the client's looking for a full uh, assessment of the whole roof inside to out then really there's no choice but to get like inside the roof void or yeah. on the roof maybe start cutting into it have a look what's underneath and, and oh, okay. do a complete assessment so um it's a, it's a case really of, of what the client wants um the, even if it's a full survey where they they want to know the interior condition you know why is the condensation happening inside the roof well yeah. the drone can still contribute to that it becomes part of a wider survey yeah. but it's not the be all and end all on its own. No. So it's different situations really, but an awful lot of what I do is simple maintenance, um, mm. just looking for the external condition. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's similar to kind of uh, what a lot of people say, you know, they have a trade and the drone is really just a sort of, not a small part, but n not not the, the be all and end all, like you mentioned, you know, it, it helps you get the pictures and the surveys of the outside of the roof done probably quicker than you would normally do, but you've still got to go inside and potentially do, you know, a bit more digging manually, I suppose, or, yes. or get someone else yeah. to do that bit yeah. as well, yeah. I see. Yeah. yeah, so it's not um, just flying 24 seven, is it? I shouldn't think. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, uh, it, it, the usefulness of the drone also depends on the type of roof. Um, yeah. You know, because uh, I think roofs fall into th three basic categories. You know, you've got flat roofs, which have usually got some sort of membrane on them. Uh, there's slate and tile roofs, pitched roofs, which are what people generally think of were, you know, on houses, but mm. obviously on bigger buildings as well. And then there's the, the metal clad roofs that you would see on big warehouses or industrial units. And, the drone's useful in different ways in each of those situations. So the, the flat roofing is actually where the drone is the least useful because oh. with a membrane, um, all the drone can do is look at the, the covering, you know, maybe it's roofing felt or it's a plastic membrane covering. Oh, see. The drone can't see the lap joints to see if they're opening up. Mm. Uh, it can't see if there's moisture in the, the layers below. So there's a certain amount you can do. You can get a good indication of the condition of the waterproofing. Um, you might see if it's failing around its perimeters. Um, you can see if outlets are blocked and that kind of thing. Mm. But really, with flat roofing, there's, there's, if you can get on it, you probably should do. But <laughs> if it's not safe, if it's no access, if it's too high, then yeah, the drone will give you a good initial mm. uh, assessment. Yeah. Um, 
pitch roofs are slates and tiles are, are excellent for drones. You know, the drone will see a missing tile, a missing slate. Oh, um, I suppose, yeah, that's true. Mm. You get close up, you can see the mortar pointing of the lead flashings around chimneys and abutment walls. Um, so it's particularly good there for looking at the external condition of, of slate roofs. Um, and metal roofs, similarly, yeah, if, if, I, mean, I do, particularly where you've got big, massive warehouses, you know, 10, 20,000 square metres. Yeah. The drone's ideal for flying all over that and having a look at the overall condition. And if, the, if it is rusting in places, the drone will see it, uh, can see the condition of roof lights, the gutters, the valley gutters, things like that. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it's good. Um, obviously, once again, it can't see what's happening below the metal sheeting, but as part of a wider survey, the, the, the drone information is, is excellent. Mm. I see. Yeah. Fantastic. For um, for th- it's funny we get quite a lot of people that you know say, oh yeah, I've got myself a drone. You know, the Mini Two is the biggest one that people generally have, and they go, oh yeah, you know, I can I can do. I'm going to set up a business doing you know, roof inspections. It always seems to come. It's one of the. You know, if, if I had a penny for every time, if I have had a pound for every time someone said it, I'd be a millionaire. Would you say <laughs> you know? It's not something that generally, you know, you can't just kind of, you know, get a drone and do it. You should probably have some knowledge behind, you know, what you're looking for. Because as you said, you know, you do, you, you give them a report to, to the client or, you know, unless the client asks for, you know, just the data set, I suppose. But would you say, you know, if you are setting up a roof inspection business or if that's going to be your primary focus, would you say it's going to be more beneficial to actually, you know, what you're looking for? Yeah, I think it goes back to an earlier point of what the, the client requires and being honest and realistic about it so yeah. you know if, if you've got no knowledge of roofs but you have a client who simply wants a batch of photographs of the roof and they're going to make their own assessment of it then you're simply obtaining data for them uh, and yeah that's that, that's quite legitimate it would help if you know a little bit about the construction of roofs because you know where to focus your camera and which bits, yeah. which bits to get close to um, but I think you can develop that fairly quickly, really. So, yeah, if as long as everybody understands what they're getting, um, yeah. that you know it isn't going to be a full assessment of the whole roof; it's an exterior um, condition assessment. Then, yeah, that, that, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. great. So, and would you say definitely that? Um, f- I suppose for yourself, obviously, you chose to you know set up your business doing roofs. For someone that's perhaps essentially setting up their own business, it doesn't have to be you know, doing roof inspections or whatever. Would you say that it's certainly beneficial to, if you are going to start a business, to set one up based on something you already know about, so that you have a key knowledge on? You know, would you say that's the best place to start, rather than starting? You know, Dave down the road works in, you know, he does fixes computers for a living or whatever, and he says, "Oh, you know what? I'm going to become a." cinematographer i'm going to do roof inspection i don't know anything about it but i've got a drone you know would you say that you know it's better to have if you're going to start a business start it with a knowledge base rather than starting a business around your drone if that makes sense it, it does make sense and from my experience i would say yes it it is good to focus and uh, once again <clears throat> Matt Williams seminars, and I think there's even a YouTube video on it where he, he says, find a focus or find a niche. Does, is, doesn't he say, what, what's your superpower? That's right. I think in, uh, one, in one of his seminars, yes. Uh, and, and I think he's right. And I, I think I've found that. I, I, think, I think it's probably a mistake to try and be all things to all men, if you like. So the fact that you can fly a drone doesn't make you a building inspector or a wedding photographer or <laughs> an event videographer or, or anything else. You know, the drone is the tool that you use to achieve the thing that you want to do in the first place. So so, it, so would you set, say that your business is a drone business or it's just a business? Because this thing, a lot of people kind of say, I'm going to set up a drone business. But, you know, for us, why we say you're not set, when I speak, say, to the people that say, you know, don't think it as you're setting up a drone business, you're setting up a business. So how would you classify your own? I think, to be honest, I did start off at the beginning calling it a drone business. Uh, I've now reversed that round and I promote myself to people now as a roof inspection business that uses drones. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And, and to be honest, you know, the, the drones are my main activity. They're the core business. 
Um, but they're not, the, I think I said earlier, they're not the be-all and end-all. Mm. Um, you were talking about equipment earlier. Another piece of equipment that I've got is a, is a camera pole. It's uh, <laughs> quite simply a, a telescopic pole. Uh, it'll reach to just over 10 metres. And I use that fairly often just to get pictures of the roof because at the end yeah. of the day, what most of my clients want is pictures, the information, the data. They're not too bothered how it's obtained. No. So yeah. if the camera pole will do the job, uh, and sometimes it does, uh, and it's been quite useful sometimes to as a as a stand-in. Um, then it's it's a means to an end. So I think really it's probably fairly important to focus, even in the world of um, professional photography. You know, ordinary photography. Photographers specialise in particular things, don't they? So you've yeah, got exactly. uh, photographers who specialise in architecture or those who do family portraits, or mm. pictures of pets, or <laughs> travel, or, you know, whatever. Um, the specialist photographers, and I, I think drone photographers probably need to do something similar, and find a focus and just, you know, <laughs> literally focus on that subject. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. It's almost a running theme, isn't it? I think with people that we have on seem to sort of always say the same sort of thing. So I think it's interesting for our listeners to sort of hear that side of it, I think, really, you know, and quite interesting as well from our point of view, too. So uh, we're going to um, briefly talk about kind of the, the new regulations sort of to finish off. But before we do that, we'll just finally talk about uh, or finish off talking about the equipment. So um, uh, thermal cameras, do you have one? And would you say they're beneficial for, for what you do? Um, yeah, the, the simple answer is yes, I have one, but I don't use it and I don't offer it as a service. Oh, okay. uh, it, it's not a high-end one. Um, it came with a, the, the drone package that I was telling you about earlier. Yes. It's, it's not a high-end one and I'm not a trained thermographer. Right, uh, okay. So I don't offer the service. I do have a reasonable understanding of thermography from past experience, mm. um, but I've, I've I'm not a, a thermographer, and I think that's a key thing really for uh, for the roofing inspections or roofing industry is that the the person using the thermal camera understands what they're doing with it. It's a very useful tool in the right hands, mm. um, and I can see that if you're searching for a missing person or an animal in mm. a field at night, then yeah, the thermal camera is probably pretty straightforward. But the thermal dy dynamics of buildings are. Or a different issue, really. You know, it requires an understanding of the construction of the building and and what the thermal signals are telling you. Mm, um, I see. And yeah. I think there can be a lot of smoke and mirrors regarding therm thermography. Mm. Um, you know, all, all the camera is seeing is heat, so yeah. it's not seeing water in a roof or, or damp ingress. It simply sees heat. Mm, um, I see. And the thermographer needs to understand, you know, what's what's just warm air coming from a vent. And what's actually moisture ingress into the roof? Because they make yeah. they look the same <laughs> on a thermogram. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think you know the, the thermographer's got responsibility to interpret the the thermograms accurately uh, yeah. and understand what they're looking at. But I see. Yeah. I, th I think generally flat roofing, you're usually looking for water ingress, damp in the in the roof covering. Uh, with pitch roofing, you're more likely to be looking for heat loss, so it's more of an energy conservation oh, okay. type yeah. situation. Yeah. Uh, but either way, you know, the, as, as long as the, the guy using the camera uh, understands the, the, the heat signals that they're seeing and mm. reports it accurately, yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent tool. But, yeah, I see. Um, but you need the knowledge to start with. You can't just go out and spend, you know, five, six grand and become a professional overnight because you won't know what you're looking for, will you, with it? Well, imagine. you won't. You know, a simple example would be on a flat roof, you, you, you could have um, vents coming out through the roof or penetrations, and you would be likely to see what looks like a warm area around mm. the vents. It's quite simply, possibly, warm air from the building. But it could look like <laughs> moisture in the roof mm. covering. Okay. So it's being able to make that differential, really, and, yeah. and you know, understand that. You don't want to do give people the wrong advice either, I guess, do you? If you don't know what you're doing, you could say, well, that's a leak, and it might not be, and then you've just wasted, you know, all of the sort of the investigation fees, yeah. I guess, to see what happens with that side of yeah. it. Yeah. The, the other thing with thermal cameras is the logistics of using them, because uh, you really need to be looking at a roof after the sun's gone down. 
so preferably mm. at dusk or even at night because that's when you get the best heat signals and if yeah. you're looking at a roof and the sun's shining on it <laughs> you're going to get conflicting signals mm. um, so then you've got the logistics of trying to fly the drone as it's going dark or even in the dark at night and <laughs> organizing drone surveys late in the evening mm. um, particularly in the summer it's quite difficult to do them at this time yeah, of year yeah. so logistically they're, they're, a, they're a tricky thing to, to actually achieve good results from mm. Interesting. Brilliant. Yeah, no, it's a uh, food for thought, I think, again, on that subject, too, actually. Yeah. So um, I think we'll uh, finish off with that sort of last question about the regulations and sub 250 drones and stuff. So I'll let Adam uh, take the lead on that one. So, uh, yeah, Adam, over to you. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, you did your, your course back in 2018 when it was the PIFCO, the PFCO, when you know, mm-hmm. everybody that did commercial work followed the same set of regulations, whether you were under uh, you know, a, a sub 250 gram drone or whether your aircraft was pushing 20 kilos. Mm. Um, so obviously, you know, back then it was, like whatever it was, you had the 30 metres on takeoff and landing, you got your 50 metre bubble around the aircraft, regardless of what you were flying. And obviously, you know, 2020 arrived, new set mm-hmm. of regulations. And yeah, all, you know, all of a sudden, you can now go out and buy a pretty decent drone, as we you know, discuss about the, the DJI Mini 2 for not a lot of money not do a lot of training in fact none technically mm. and collect data with no distance from uninvolved people or, or buildings and you know what i'd like to know from you tony is really kind of i suppose on one side has the new regulations affected your business from a point of view as you know has it benefited you because you can use these aircraft now without thinking oh god i've got to stay x amount of meters from these buildings and the other f- side I'd like to ask you about is potentially the negatives of the new regulations that you've seen, potentially from people coming in with these drones, with no training, going, oh, you know, I'll, I'll, do, your, I'll do your roof inspection, I'll do this, um, with little to no training or equipment. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to rewind to the beginning of the question now. <laughs> so <Sorry. laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so, the, so the benefits for you, benefits for you. How have you found, uh, yes. if anything, any any benefits to the new regulations I, sort of applied to you? Yeah, I mean, I went out, I've bought one and I have been using it. Um, the, the, the number of jobs uh, were under my PFCO I hadn't been able to do. And, you know, jobs in town centres, for example, uh, or close to pavements with people passing by. And I have actually, in the last couple of years, I've passed... Uh, jobs like that to other drone companies and other operators who've got the relevant OSC to mm. do it. Mm. And, and I've found now that some of those jobs, I can actually do them with the Mini, still yeah. legally. Yeah. OK, <laughs> with <clears throat> with the, all the right paperwork and the risk assessments, but at the end of the day, I can still go and do uh, drone inspections on premises which previously I would have asked somebody with an OSC to go and do. Mm. Um, so from that point of view, yes, that's that's been a benefit. Um, I must have it at first I thought it was going to be a big problem because I started to hear of building surveyors and contractors buying their own little yeah. drone and starting <laughs> to do surveys for themselves and I thought oh right that's that's going to diminish my business. Um, in actual fact it hasn't happened because um, oh, what I've found has happened was these the guys who've bought the companies who bought their own little drones, they're only using them for small domestic type roof inspections. The large warehouses and industrial units, they'll still come to myself to do those. Yeah, okay. So, and really the, the smaller jobs, they would never have come to me for anyway. Mm. So I haven't really lost anything there. What I have is I've gained in the number of jobs that I can actually do legally okay. using the drone. And I know you, Adam, I think you did, um, a podcast recently didn't you on the use of uh, the sub 250 drones in streets yes. and things like mm-hmm. that and, you know which was which is good and interesting and you know if it's a busy shopping street then no you're not going to go out with it but once the streets quietened down you might go and do it but yeah. i wouldn't have tried to do it under the pfco with a two kilogram drone yeah uh, but so it's actually uh, on balance it's been a benefit to me to uh, to be able to do that yeah, that's good to that's know. That's great. It'd be mm. interesting to actually speak to somebody who you know potentially did have 
an OSC and actually see how the new regulations affected them. Because like you said, you know, you can now yeah. work that you were passing on to them, you know, whether you were taking a cut or not, I don't know. But, you know, work you were passing on to them, you've now brought in-house because you can do it legally. It'd be interesting to see, yeah, for, speak to those companies to see actually how the new mm. regulations have affected them, whether it's for better or for worse from from, from their point of view. Mm. Well, I, I can do it legally, but we, we need to bear in mind it's... I shouldn't say this, but it's only roof inspection. Um, yeah. So it doesn't require high-end photography. And, and the camera on the Mini, especially if you take the pictures in RAW and process them through Photoshop or Lightroom, um, the pictures are, are more than good enough for roof inspection. They might not cut it if it was for promotional photography or, or more high-end stuff. So yeah. I think the people at the OSCs would still be called on for that kind of thing. Uh, but what, yeah, it, it can replace the roof inspection side of things. I think the other thing I would add is that's my particular business. Um, there might be a lot of people um, setting themselves up to do roof inspections with the Mini or something similar, but it's a different part of the market. You know, like maybe the residential, uh, smaller residential market, the estate uh, agency, that kind of thing, which I don't really go near. So in my particular business, working on the bigger buildings, um, I, I don't. I haven't come across people sort of encroaching on that because the what the the, the 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 criteria there is that the the building surveying companies and the roofing contractors, they will all have um, criteria for their approved suppliers, which will I be see. things yeah. like qualifications, insurances, uh, you know, various bits of documentation. Um, and I think anyone who's just set up now and got a mini and offering to um, to do roof inspections might have a problem getting on approved lists without having something a bit more, uh, what's the word, sophisticated in terms of mm. insurance and qualification. I see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so I suppose that what you're kind of aiming for is a different, I suppose, vertical market to the... Yeah the others to people doing as you say you know domestic roof inspections it's a completely different it, yeah, there's client. a market for it yeah yeah, yeah. Yes. There's, there's a market for it it's just not one that i choose to go after i think uh, mm. i prefer working for the, the the companies who can keep coming back with repeat business yeah, yeah. i suppose yeah. that's the that's thing it's it with the domestic yeah, you know, generally you'll you'll do, you won't go back to someone's roof, I would imagine, unless there's something absolutely wrong, uh, terribly wrong with it. Um, you don't go back regularly, whereas I suppose with you, I don't know whether it's twelve months or every couple of years, you do do a a fresh inspection to make sure things are still tip top. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's different markets, really. See, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I think it's uh, 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 yeah another another piece of information that we didn't know about actually as well about uh, you know focusing on different markets and uh, obviously yeah you need to cater for your customers and use the correct aircraft for that side of things um, as well. So uh, I think that almost uh, takes us to the end of uh, our sort of conversation. Adam, have we uh, got anything else to add at all or not? I, I think we're at the end, aren't we? I think that's covered most things for for me. Unless Tony, you've got anything you'd like to um, like to add? Um, yeah, I think we've covered a lot of ground there. I hope we mm. haven't bored people with, <laughs> with roof inspection. But, uh, I'll say we'll, no, we'll see that we'll, we'll compare the metrics to it to some of the other podcasts. See if we uh, have a tail off. <laughs> but yeah, well, I've, all right, I've listened... you never know. Yeah, all right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've, I've listened to a few of your podcasts and uh, and they're good. It's it's um, it's it's a good format. You know, it's 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 informal and, and conversational. So, mm, yeah, yeah, I quite like yeah. it. And, and, but, you know, covering interesting subjects at the same time. Mm, that's great. Good. Well, that's uh, a good note to finish on, I think, then, isn't it, really? So, uh, once again, thanks very much, Tony, uh, for, for coming on and spending some time talking. Uh, it's been really interesting. And, uh, yeah, we'll hopefully speak to you again soon, I guess. Yeah, well, thanks, 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 thanks Adam. Yeah, I've enjoyed it. Cool. Brilliant. OK, well, uh, yeah, thanks a lot. And we'll uh, speak to you soon. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and also leave us a review if you don't mind too. That will definitely help uh, the algorithms and uh, hopefully push us towards the top of the drone or UAV um, podcast uh, top 10, I suppose, as well. So um, that's pretty much all we've got time for. Thanks again to Tony and we'll see you all again next week. Fly safe from blue skies. Blue skies.